I want us to open our Bibles to the book of Jeremiah, chapter 1, verse 5. And then another finger, put it on Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Jeremiah 1, 5. And then Acts 13, 36. The title that I'm sharing from tonight is Born to be Fulfilled. Born to be Fulfilled. Jeremiah 1 5, the Bible says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations, as Jeremiah 1 5. And then Acts 13 36, the word of the Lord says, Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. He was buried with his ancestors and his body decayed. That's Acts chapter 13, verse 36. Now, last time when I was here, I told you about uh, the theme that I had in 2010 when I started uh, pastoring uh, the, my former church in Mogoditani. It was the year of restoration. And how I later realized that restoration was not just my message, but it was who I am. And interestingly, when I looked at the last theme that I had uh, with my former church, uh, it was a season of fulfillment. Actually, in 2020, it was the year of fulfillment, and then 2021, we made it the season of fulfillment because it was a time where I felt that for me personally I had fulfilled the mandate that I went there for. I felt that uh, what God wanted me to do in that place uh, was done. I had fulfilled it and because I had fulfilled my part in that I was fulfilled and that is why we are able to move on uh, without looking back, without holding to anything that was there because we knew that what God wanted us to do, uh, we had done. An uh, assignment that was given to us, it was done and there was a, a sense of satisfaction. To be honest with you, I actually thought that after finishing that church uh, building and putting everything that we had put in there, that in the beginning of the year 2020, the Lord will release me to say, now you have done your part. I was ready to leave uh, from 2020, but God kept me there until 2021. And there was a sense, and there is still a sense of fulfillment uh, that I did what I, I had to do. I gave my all while I was there, and there is nothing that I can look back and regret that I did not do. When I was there, I was fully there and I made sure that I did everything as if it was my own and for that I am uh, grateful. And so I want you to understand that even as we talk about fulfillment, uh, what does fulfillment really entail? What does it mean? Fulfillment is a feeling of satisfaction that you get from doing or achieving something. You feel satisfied that you have done something you are supposed to do or you feel satisfied that you achieved something that you see as of great importance, especially if it is something that we are born for. When you do something that we are born for and you finish it and you complete it, there is a fulfillment that you feel within uh, yourself. It's something that is clicking with your very core, with who you are. Uh, it's almost like you are that piece of a puzzle that goes into its space and it fits so well, it is so comfortable. It is so fulfilling when you have achieved that which you were born for. So it is an achievement of something that is desired or something that was promised or something that was predicted. Uh, that is what uh, fulfillment is all about. Uh, when Jesus read the scroll, as I read last time when I was here, uh, at the end of reading that scroll, he says, Today, in your hearing, this scripture is fulfilled. Hallelujah. What you have been waiting for 
uh, today is fulfilled, it is done. I am here to make sure that everything that I have read, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me for years, anointed me, uh, you know, to heal the broken hearted, to open uh, the blind eyes, all of those things. He's saying to them, it is fulfilled, it is done, it is achieved. The promise has been made and it is here uh, to go on. So fulfillment is that feeling that you have when you feel that empty gap that is within you. Fulfillment is that which gives you answers to your reason for being on earth. Are you hearing what I'm saying? When you are fulfilled, it is when you realize that you are doing what you were born for. And the question that I want to ask you is, are you fulfilled in your life? Because you see, a sense of fulfillment is one of the greatest way that you can defeat sin in your life. One of the reasons why we struggle with sinning and with sin is because we are still looking for fulfillment in the wrong places because we are not fulfilled in ourselves. And so the big question that we need to ask ourselves is, and the, that you need to ask yourself is, am I fulfilled in my life? Is there a sense that something is missing? And if there is that sense that something is missing, something is not in its place, what is happening to you to try and fill that gap? When you are fulfilled, that gap does not exist anymore. Hallelujah. So fulfillment uh, kind of brings you to a place of peace, a place of satisfaction, a place where you feel that the promise that was made, you have received it. You live in it. You are in it. Hallelujah. And at the core of humanity, all of us, we desire to be fulfilled. Because without being fulfilled in our lives, we continue running up and down looking for that fulfillment. And that's where the enemy takes advantage. And he fulfills you or he gives you fake things to try and fill you with those things. Fulfill you with the wrong things. When you are looking for satisfaction and you are not finding it, and you see a lot of activity around, you think that by being involved in all of those things that are around, you will find fulfillment. Today, in the day of social media, we see people very happy. They were in some area there. Everyone was dancing, you know. It looked like everyone was happy. And you are sensing that inside of you, there is a gap. You want to be happy. You want uh, to have joy in your life. And when you look at them, it seems like they have joy. And so what do you do? Because you are looking for that kind of fulfillment in your life, you go to those places that are not good for you. And when you get there, you find that you fill your life with things that do not match with how you were made. And you find yourself trapped in many of those things. You see, because I talk a lot about our foundations, family is supposed to give us a sense of belonging, a sense of identity, a sense of security. When we don't have that, when for some reason that missed out uh, at an early stage, we look for those things in the wrong places. We want to be secure. And, you know, we become insecure and so we want something that secures us. And that is where now we fall into all kinds of problems. Because there is something that is lacking inside of us. We are not fulfilled. We are not happy. And because we are not happy, we think that there is something that will give us the happiness that we are looking for. And sadly, many of those things that seem to be promising, uh, you know, to give you that fulfillment are all fake. They leave you more torn and more and needing more of things that will fulfill you only to find out that they are opening more and more holes in your life. Because of this lack of fulfillment, the enemy has worked very hard in us uh, to divert us totally uh, from what God wants us to be and what God wants us to do. And he has you know, taken advantage of those things that have broken us and he has come in and brought his agenda to us. When he came, the enemy he came first in the Garden of Eden by questioning uh, Adam and Eve and he kind of succeeded in distorting their, their image. How does the enemy manage to bring us to a place where we are not fulfilled? 
He first of all starts by attacking our identity. That is the big thing. When those of you who have read the book, Storing Your Soul, you realize that the biggest problems come from when your identity is distorted, has been destroyed. And when you do not know who you are, then the enemy comes in and he begins to say, this is who you should be. And that is how he fills you with the wrong things. And so in the Garden of Eden, he kind of succeeded because he made Adam and Eve question who they were. He made them question the image of God in them. He made them feel like there was something that was lacking in them. Something was not adequate about them. And because they wanted to be fulfilled inside, they were tempted. The Bible says, when she looked at the fruit and saw that it was desirable to the eyes, hallelujah, and tasty, good for food, she took the fruit because the enemy had managed to convince her that God was hiding something from her. There was something better that God did not want her to have. Is it not said how we always listen to the lies of the enemy? You know, the enemy has got issues with us. His biggest issue with you is that you are made in the image of God. He cannot stand the fact that somebody made out of clay can resemble God, can stand here and stand on behalf of God, can speak here and speak the word of God and have the authority that God has. The enemy of our souls cannot believe that. And so it's very, very important that we reclaim our identity. Because when we reclaim our identity, we close the door that the enemy opens into our lives to try and fulfill us with the wrong things. So at the Garden of Eden, he kind of succeeded, but Jesus Christ came. And when Jesus came, the story became totally different. We know that Adam, the first Adam, uh, we fell into sin because of him. But the second Adam, we came back to become sons and daughters of God because of him. Hallelujah. And when we sinned against God, God made a promise that, yes, you will bite the heel of uh, the man, but the man will crush your head. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ came. When he came, he crushed the head of the serpent. Let me tell you, the devil that you are afraid of today, the snake that you are afraid of today, has no head. Have you ever seen a lizard when you kill it and you see the tail going like this? And some of you are so scared <laughs> of the tail that you run away from that thing. Hallelujah. Now, in our case, the head of the serpent has been crushed. Who crushed it? Jesus, the head of the church. And so we have the devil still given a chance and he's wiggling around and we see the dust. The Bible says he's roaring like a lion looking for someone to devour. But when he opens his mouth, what do we see? Gums only, no teeth. But we are so afraid. We have allowed him to dictate to us who we are. How did we get to that place? Brokenness. The enemy is using our fear, our fear of rejection, our fear of failure, our fear of all kinds of things. And so when he roars with our teeth, we run because we have allowed fear to take over because of the brokenness that is there. But now in Christ, hallelujah, we are more than conquerors. The Bible says, who being in the very nature God, did not see equality with God as something to be grasped. But what did he do? He humbled himself to death. What kind of death? Death on the cross. The death of a criminal. He had no sin yet. He died like a criminal, naked, so that you and I can find life in him. So that you and I can represent him well here on earth. Ask your neighbor, do you know who you are? Hallelujah. You see, there is, you are supposed to have Christ in you. When you walk around, do not look at your, your weakness. The one who crushed the serpent lives inside of you. 
Hallelujah. Now, many times when we see somebody, a child of God like us, who is able to make life-changing differences in people's lives, what do we do? We worship them. Again, we say, hey, this man, you know, if I can only touch you know, the, the, their shoes, if I can hold their hand, why, why do we do that? Because we think we don't have what they have. That's very sad. Hallelujah. You see, the testimonies that we are hear, hearing here about people's lives being transformed. Do you know that you have the same power? You have the same authority? You know, when I was growing up, I, I, I had lots of rejection. I didn't know who I was. I was insecure. I was told I was handsome, but I couldn't approach a girl to say hello. <laughs> because I, I was not confident in anything. I didn't know who I was. But when Christ came and he began, began to, to rebuild me, you know, heal my wounds, I began to understand that Christ in me is the hope of glory, that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, that I don't have to be afraid to stand against anyone because greater is he that is in me than the one who is out there in the world. Hallelujah. So how has the enemy managed to do this to us? How has he managed uh, to totally dismantle us and we find ourselves uh, that we are not fulfilled, we are not happy, we are not where we should be, even when we have so much knowledge. Number one, he has attacked our identity. We are broken by rejection and our dysfunctional families. That is why in the movement of restoration, we always go back there. We don't just hear that you are a Christian, you are born again, and we get excited about that. It's good. But is your mind, is your thinking transformed? That's the most important thing. You may be born again, you may be a child of God, but if you still see yourself, you know, as a worm, like we usually uh, say uh, when we are praying, if that's what you see about yourself, when that fake lion roars, what are you going to do? You are going to run. So the enemy has attacked our identity and we need to recapture our identity. Hallelujah. So the first thing uh, that the enemy has done to stop us from being fulfilled is to attack our identity by the brokenness, by the rejection and dysfunctional families. He has done this so well that it has gone on and on and on. And sadly, uh, this thing is done and sometimes you are not even aware that what you are doing is brokenness. Many of our parents, because of where we come from, poverty, education was very important. And so they had to go out there and study and pursue their careers so that we can have better lives. But in that also there was neglect. You know, a young girl left alone feeling like she has to take responsibility of her parent. She's skipping a very important part of being a child. And so she doesn't have emotions as she grows up because she doesn't know how to be a child. She always had to wipe her tears and deal with the stuff that is there. And so something dies inside. And one day when they are married and they are with their husband, the emotion is not there. The part that they need to play you know, I look at my wife and my children. Many a times they are totally similar. Do you know how? <laughs> a woman should be able to be like a child when they are with their husband. You understand? But if you have been trained that you are a strong woman, you, you are going to fight with your husband because you are leading and the husband is also leading. Because when I have always been strong, you are the firstborn, you are leading, you know, you take charge, you, you are taking control and the husband is just like, ah. <laughs> and when I don't even, you are not even aware that you are doing something wrong because you are like, yeah, things must be done. If, if you are not going to do it, I'm going to do it. And the husband feels like, there's, there's something wonderful about being the strong woman. But on the other hand, if you are always making all the decisions in, your, in the house and your husband is just hearing, there, there's going to be a point where they feel like, ah, no, no, no. 
Wamo I'm just like it. Kuri leha 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 muna o mango o mango kotiliwa. And you are not even aware because that's how you grew up. You are doing that to your siblings. And you are hating your husband over and over again. And one day he comes to you and says, "I'm divorcing you." And you are like, "Where does this come from?" <laughs> Hallelujah! I'm talking about reality. It's because you are strong. Can I hear an amen from all the strong women? <laughs> you know what you are doing to your husband, right? <laughs> It's good to be strong, but you need to be a child also. My wife is a very strong person. She has an opinion. She's able to say her part, but she can become a child to me. You know, she can she can cry for things, not crying, crying, but you know, women. Do you, it's okay, men. It's okay for women to do that. Men, can I hear an amen? But we don't want to be led by women all the time, telling you what to do and how to do it. Hallelujah, Amen. And the second thing that the enemy did is when we we wanted God, when we responded to the hunger of God, the enemy then replaced it with religion. That is so sad. Instead of having an intimate relationship with God, something that Jesus Christ came to earth to bring us. Then religion came in, and religion took over. And when religion took over, it was a matter of rules and regulations. You should not do that. You should not that. Kuri, you are being policed everywhere. You are told what to do and what not to do. You know, when you are moving around with rules and regulations, you are disconnected because you want to make sure you don't break the rules. And so the enemy. Uh, made sure that if he can stop us from accessing God, he replaces a relationship with God with religion. So we moved from the slavery of sin to the slavery of religion, and the enemy has kept us there. That is why today in our churches there are so many that are bleeding. Many of us are staying in our marriages because God hates divorce, but we are unhappy. We are broken. It's painful. We are just saying, "What will people say?" Why? We never allowed the Christ that we profess to come into our hearts and deal with those things that will make us fail in relationships. Hallelujah! And the third thing that the enemy did was to convince us that we can find fulfillment in external things. Things that are out there, material things, nice houses, nice cars, nice wife, nice husband, nice children, all of those things that are out there. He convinced us that if we have these things, and the narrative in the church for the past years with the prosperity gospel is that you have to be rich. If you are rich, if you are driving expensive cars, then God is really with you. And so, even in the church, we have pushed this narrative of prosperity, where we think that by having expensive things, we will find fulfillment. And again and again, it has failed because it's not only those who preach prosperity who are Christians who are prospering. Everyone who knows how to work money can prosper. There are lots of people who hate God who are very wealthy, not rich, wealthy. Hallelujah. And so what is the difference? There must be something more that we should be able to offer to this world. And so the third thing that the enemy did was to convince us that fulfillment is in external things. The things that are seen with our eyes. But it is not. There's nothing wrong with having wealth, nothing wrong with having money, but if that is the source of your joy and fulfillment, you are going to be looking and you will never find it. Hallelujah. The fourth thing that the enemy did was to convince us to uh, pursue what we call personal gratification instead of purpose. Instead of fulfilling the purpose for which we were born, we are looking for things that gratify us. We go out clubbing. We go out, you know, with as many different partners as possible, thinking that we will find fulfillment in that. That is joy. We as the church must stop all of these lies 
of the, the enemy. Hallelujah. And so the enemy knew that all of these things will not satisfy us. But what they will do is that they will destroy us. We will destroy ourselves in trying to find fulfillment in the wrong places. Now, how do we correct this error? When you read John 10:10, 10, 10, the Bible says, The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But Jesus came so that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. Hallelujah. That is what the thief came to do. So the things that I was talking about uh, that the enemy has done to steal fulfillment from us is what the thief has done. We need to see the devil for who he is. He is a thief. He is a destroyer. He came to do just that in our lives. And so as we begin to see that he came to, to steal from us, to destroy us, and to kill us, and we begin to relate with him like that. You know, some of us are having a python as a pet. You know the story of a woman who loved her python and used to sleep with The python will come and, you know, be close and she thought it was affection. Oh, this python really... The python apparently was measuring itself, whether it was big enough to swallow her. <laughs> and, and as it was coming close and, you know, she was sure that, yeah, no, we are really together. We are one. And then one day, while she was sleeping, the python opened its mouth and swallowed her. Many of us are sleeping with the python. We think it's our friend. We think this python will never change and become the python. The devil is, is a thief. He's a killer. He's a murderer. He's a liar. Once we know who he is, I mean, we put him where he belongs. We should be able to fulfill the purpose for which we were born. So what do we do? Number one, we must reconnect to our original image. How do we do that? By accepting Jesus as our personal savior. It starts there. You see, Jesus paid a price that you and I could not pay. He died on the cross for my sins, for your sins. You couldn't pay for your sins. And because of that sacrifice, you and I can find salvation in God. But it doesn't end there. Number two, we need to allow the process of sanctification that God should deal with us. You know, the programming of the world that we have been going through over the years so that we are truly transformed to become like Christ and so that we are not just Christians in our behavior, morally, but we can become Christ to the nations, to our communities, to people that we interact with. Being a Christian is not a label that you just stick on you to say, yes, I'm a Christian. When the Christians were first called Christians in Antioch, it was a mockery. They were saying, look at these guys, they are little Christs. Why? Because they looked just like Christ, they spoke like Christ, and so they mocked them, calling them Christians. Before that, they were called the people of the way. For Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And so being a Christian should not be you just living a nice, moral, Christian life. It should be about you being able to make a difference in the lives of people. And how do you do that? Allow the process of sanctification to take place in your life. Hallelujah. There must be real transformation in your heart and in your mind. The way you feel, the way you think must show that this person is somebody who has gone through a process. There's a lot in our family background that the enemy has wired and programmed us to. And in Africa, we commonly call it generational curses, which is actually just generational sins that we continue. When we stop them, those sins, the curses must also stop. Hallelujah. Because the sins are the door that brings curses in our lives. And so when the sins stop, there is no way the cases will have, uh, continue to have power and authority over us. And so it's very important that we allow ourselves to go through that process of sanctification where we are taught the basic principles of Christianity, the doctrines of Christianity. We know what baptism is all about. We know what holiness is all about. All of this 
important uh, teachings so that we understand the word. For it is the word that transforms our thinking. Hallelujah. And the third thing that we need to do is to allow us to deal with our childhood knots. Those brokenness, those things that happened in our lives, the wounds that we are carrying around. And we must be willing to go back. Many of us, we have just, you know, built a wall, a big wall and covered those things and we have become strong and we have moved on. No. Whatever is buried in your subconscious mind and you have not allowed to come to the surface and to be dealt with, continues to control your mind, continues to control your life, continues to control your thinking. And so there are many mistakes that you made in relating that you may not be aware of because that is how you are programmed in your subconscious mind. As we allow those childhood knots, you know, to break and we allow Jesus to come in to heal our broken hearts, oh, we become something totally different. Hallelujah. We must be willing to go back to those buried memories and say, Jesus, I trust you with my wounds. I trust you with these things so that I can become who you say I am. And then the fourth thing, once we are healed, we must be aggressive in healing others. One of the most fulfilling things, and, and I'm sure you have experienced it here and there, when somebody comes into your life and they are having trouble, they are going through stuff, and you say things that change their lives. Oh, there is no fulfillment like that. And they come to you years later and say, you don't know what you did in my life. Uh, today, before we started the service, I was just walking around greeting people and I saw a, a tall man at the back there and he said, Pastor, uh, you have never met me, but I have met you through your book. He said, I'm telling you, my life is different. Just from reading the book, I'm so honored to be here. Uh, it has done things. Do you know how satisfying that is? Hallelujah. When you can give life to somebody else, give them hope when they totally had given up thinking that it is over and you can change their lives around. Hallelujah. Imagine a young lady like Topo suffering migraines, but when you look on the surface, everything is in place. Doing very well with her studies. She understands, she knows how to help people, but she's struggling with this. And she has not even been able to diagnose herself, even though she's able to diagnose others. <laughs> Hallelujah. But you see, when we connect with God, God is able to show us the things that we are not even aware of. Hallelujah. So we must be aggressive. And I want to encourage all of you, I know there are all kinds of professions in here. You know, some of you are electrical engineers, mining engineers, doctors, some of you are teachers, you are different. You should be able to say, God, I am here in this school working here. How can I be salt here? Instead of inviting people to your church, many of us are very good at inviting people to our church. But are you good at showing Christ where you are? When people are in trouble in their workplaces, can they come to you and say, I've seen something in you. I don't know what it is, but somehow I feel I can sh share with you what I'm going through. And when you open your mouth, wisdom comes out. Hallelujah. My desire is that the professionals that are here, people that are here in their workplaces, they can say a word and plant a seed in somebody's life that makes that person think, well, why did that person say that? And when they are in trouble, they can go back and say, there's something that you said last time. Or there's something that I observed in you. And people just open up to you. Many of us, we think we must go for training. You must be Pastor Mohani. You must have... No, 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 no. God desires that you position yourself. Know who you are. Position yourself and be willing to be an instrument. And wherever you are, as you listen... God begins to give you wisdom. There are times when I am in counseling sessions and I am hearing very complicated things and I start speaking. As I am continuing to speak, in my heart I'm like, oh no, I wish I was recording myself because I've never heard this wisdom before. 
I'm telling you the truth. I say things that I've never said before. I come up with solutions that I've never come up with before and I realize that I cannot be proud because this can only be God. Hallelujah. And where does it start? It starts with you just surrendering, allowing God to heal you so that you, you, you die. The, the, the self, the part that is you, is God. And God can go through you, speak through you. You can be God to people. Not in a prideful way. Not, you can represent him so well that it's like they are interacting with God when they are with you. Somebody say it's possible. it's possible. Say I can do it. Yes. Through Christ. Who strengthens me. Yes. Hallelujah. It is my desire. My brethren. Brothers and sisters. That we will all be healed. And all represent Christ well. And let me tell you. I've seen thousands of people. Uh, changing. And being able to do just that. Many of the people, there was a time where God allowed me to go back into counseling for about three months this year, March, April, May. Many of the people who came were people who said to me, I saw my friend at work, I saw the difference in them, and I asked them, how did you get here? And, and they, they, they told me their story, and I read your book, and I'm here, and I'm telling you, you know, through the book that I've written uh, with the wisdom that God gave me, I've seen God taking down 10 sessions to two. 10 sessions to two. And with the workbook, I mean, it's, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And so I want each and every one of you who calls themselves a Christian to know that you can find fulfillment in this world by doing what you we are born for. Now, I want us to go back uh, to the scriptures that we, we have just read about David and Jeremiah. Jeremiah was born for a purpose, and God is very clear. Before you were in your mother's womb, I knew you and I ordained you, I assigned you a particular job. Do you know that before you were born, God knew you? Do you know that he assigned you a particular thing to do here on earth? He did, just like Jeremiah. But Jeremiah had a lot of doubt. Don't we have doubts in ourselves? Do you know why you have doubts? It's because of the fear that you have. The fear that you do not qualify. The fear that... You do not have what it takes. Because you have failed before, you think you will fail in the assignment that you have today. Hallelujah. Fear is the opposite of faith. Where do we get fear from? Because the enemy has tried so much to disqualify us. And let us look at David. The Bible says, uh, when David had served his generation, had fulfilled the purpose for which he was born. He rested with his ancestors. You can see there, David, we know David's life. Do you know that David was disqualified by his own family? He was rejected by his own family. When the prophet of God, uh, Samuel, came to anoint one of the sons of Jesse, David was not even called to the meeting. He was a shepherd boy that they forgot about in the bush. And as the sons passed before uh, the prophet, the prophet said, no. The, according to his eyes, he saw somebody tall, strong, and said, surely this is the one. God said, no. The father had also said, no. Because he didn't even call him to the meeting. He didn't think he qualified. Do you think the things that you have gone through, the things that happened in your life disqualify you? Do you think I qualify? Did I think I qualified? No. The enemy brings things in our lives to disqualify us. And so whatever it is that the enemy has used, he may have used your background to disqualify you. He may have used your past failures to disqualify you. Whatever the enemy has used to disqualify you, let me tell you something. You were qualified even before you were born. 
Hallelujah. It does not matter what mistakes you have made. It does not, not, not matter where you have been. You were qualified before you were born. And when you were born, the devil came and said, I am going to disqualify him so that I can see whether he will find his way back to his real qualifications. Let me tell you, you are more than what you are today. I want to say this again. You are more than what you are today. You are more than how people have labeled you. Hallelujah. As you allow God to heal you, as you allow God to lead you, as you allow God to bring you together, a giant will rise up from you and you will begin to go out conquering and to conquer. You are more than your mistakes. If you think you are bad, there is a man who was called Saul in the New Testament. Do you know how bad he was? He stoned Christians. He murdered Christians. He went out of his way to find Christians who were hiding so that he can bring them to Jerusalem for them to be stoned. Now that's bad. Hallelujah. He was a murderer. And he found that he was doing the will of God by killing people that he believed were out of the way. One day was one day, as we say in Botswana. As he was going to Damascus to go and get more Christians, he had an encounter. Soul, soul, why are you persecuting me? And from that encounter, already he says, who are you? Lord. How did he know he was Lord so quickly? <laughs> who are you, Lord? I am Jesus Christ, whom you are persecuting. Paul came after Jesus had resurrected and gone up to heaven. But Jesus is saying, you are persecuting me. When the devil or whoever persecutes you, they are persecuting Christ. Christ takes it personal. Are you hearing what I'm saying? He takes it very personal. You represent him. The question is, are you representing him well? Hallelujah. And so he changed. He became something else. So I want to say to you, no matter how bad you have been, this Christ can bring you around. And today, when we look at the New Testament, the books that we read in the New Testament, the majority of them written by Paul. Who knows what your life can do? And you are looking down upon yourself and you are saying, I cannot make it, I cannot do it. Do you know how many people God has reserved for you to change their lives? Oh, but I have failed in my marriage. I have betrayed my wife. I have not done this. Let me tell you something. When Christ comes, when you are healed, that testimony that is so terrible can be healing for many other people. Because in Christ there is no failure. Hallelujah. Whatever has disqualified you, I want you to know that Christ qualifies you. He qualifies you. He has qualified us. I should not be here, but by grace, I stand here before you today. And so the message of restoration is saying to you, you who have been in the church and failed for a long time, that your life can turn around. The things that are uh, you know, eating at your soul, they can stop. To somebody who has been far from God, you have been failing and coming back failing and you are hungry. I'm saying to you that there is hope for you. Things can change around. And you can be that person who goes out there and heals many broken hearts. It's a testimony of many people who are here today. Let us stand up. As we stand up, I want us to close our eyes. And if you are here, you are saying, Pastor, I need this restoration in my life. I need Christ to come into my life to change me. I want to be different. I want to give you an opportunity today to receive him as your Lord and Savior. It all starts there. Somebody may say, I failed so many times. I've been in the church, but I failed so many times. I want to say to you, he came for those 
who failed in themselves. So if you are here and you're saying, I want to receive this Jesus, I want my life to change, just raise your hand right where you are. Just raise it. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. I see all of those hands. I see all of those hands. Just raise those hands. God bless you. And I want you to pray this prayer. Church, let's help them pray this prayer. Just lift both of your hands and pray this prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I've heard you today. You have spoken to my life. I recognize that I'm a sinner. I need you in my life, oh God. Come and guide me. I repent of my sins. I accept you as my personal savior. And I ask that you, oh God, will lead me to the place of life. Today, I reject the devil and I accept Jesus as my savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God some glory. I'm going to ask those of you who uh, responded to the call and who are saying, yes, I'm serious. I want to take this journey. We are very uh, big on making sure that you are established in Christ. Uh, I'm going to ask that you just go to the back behind that banner there. The ushers will be there with you uh, to just speak to you and give you guidance on what we need to do. We also want to take you through counseling and we are very glad to let you know that from next month we will have an office here in Block 9, not far from here. And so we will be able to start taking appointments uh, so that we can help people out. Yes. Yes. Things are moving fast. Uh, faster than we have the money but they are moving so make sure that the money comes also so that we pay for all the rent and all the instruments all the things that we are hiring uh, but it's moving and we are not worried this is God's mission this is God's vision and he will provide for it and so it is our desire to see as many people healed as much as possible let's lift our hands to the Lord as I pray father we want to thank you for today we thank you that you are faithful God, able to do exceedingly, abundantly above all that you could ever think of, imagine or in us for. May your grace and your mercy and your love continue to work in us. Father, you are the healer. May you heal, may you bring life to your children today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God some praise. Hallelujah. We are going to continue singing. We have closed the service. But because we pray for people, those who need ministry, you are sick in your body, uh, we pray for the sick, they are healed. Uh, you know, whatever it is that you are going through and you need to be prayed for, you will be coming here as the minister at that side. And those of you who accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, we want you to just go behind that banner. They will talk to you briefly and just, you know, guide you. Then you can come and join this one. We will be waiting here to make sure that everyone who needs prayer is prayed for. God bless you and thank you so much for coming. See you next time, 3 o'clock. We believe there will be no problems this time around. Let's be here on time so that we start and we can finish by 5 o'clock. The Lord bless you. Praise the worship.